Welcome to Most Writers and Fans, the podcast that explores the intersection between writing... Wait, let me start the recording so that I actually have a recording of this. <laughs> <laughs> the most of the podcast episode. Welcome to Most Writers and Fans, the podcast that explores the po- intersection between writing and fandom. My name is Terry Bartley, and I'll be your host. Today I'm coming to you live from the Haunted Bookshop in Mobile, Alabama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and I'm joined by the, the owner of the shop, who's also an author herself, Angela Trigg. So how are you doing today, Angela? Well, I'm doing great, thank you. <laughs> so so what is what has it been like, like being like this year and Pride and all those things? Um, this year's been great. This is our first year in our new location. Um, we uh, opened in 2018 uh, around the corner, and then we moved in here in the summer last year. And so we're experiencing all of our firsts in our new space. So this was our first Pride. Um, art walk um, in our new place, which was actually ground cen- uh, um, central for all of it because the parade started right there. So it was really awesome being in the middle of all that. <laughs> oh, very cool. And, and business has been good, all those things? Oh, like yeah. you feel good about where you're at? Oh, yeah. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, so I have been driving around the country. <laughs> so that is how I have been. Um, I just got done. Um, I, I stayed with my sister who lives in Florida for three days. So that was a nice where break. Where in Florida? Um, just south of Orlando. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I'm from West Virginia, and I drove down to Florida, stopping at various bookstores along the way, and then I came back up, and this is my first show today, because I have two shows oh, <laughs> today. Where are you going next? New Orleans, after oh, this. Oh, where? Um, the, um, what is it? So Tubby and Coos is this oh, queer own mobile yep. bookstore. I was just there last And time. they're mm-hmm. doing Sorry. a book fair at Miles uh, uh, Tap Room and mm-hmm. Brewery. Okay. Um, this has all been thrown together for me, so, okay. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> trying to remember things. But um, yeah, so they're doing a book fair that I'm kind of like the center of. So mm-hmm. I'm actually pretty excited about it. Oh, and it's cool. going to be this evening at 6. But also I'm getting used to time changes because I think it's actually at 5, oh, your okay. time. No, we're but, in the same time zone. But I'm I'm not. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, just, I just crossed into central time. Okay. So that has been a new experience. Like I woke up this morning and it was seven thirty your time, uh-huh. but it but then my clock in my car is eight thirty, oh, okay. and it was it was yeah. a, it was I wanted to sleep not as long, and I was like, but I probably should because I have two shows today. So, <laughs> so it's been a whole thing to get used to this. Oh wow! Well, tell Candace I said hey because I know Candace from Tubby and Coos. Yeah, I will for sure. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna take a quick break. When we get right back, we'll talk into Angela about her writer's journey. All right, so there would usually be like music or a break or something, but because okay. we're here, we'll just go straight into it. Okay. Welcome back to Mr. Writers and Fans. My name is Terry Bartley, and I am joined once again with Angela Trigg. So, Angela, let's talk a little bit about like your journey as a writer. Like, what got you into it? What got, made you write to begin with? Um, actually, funnily enough, it's uh, due to my grandmother, who's the one who started the original haunted bookshop here in Mobile in 1941 with Cameron Plummer, and um, she had just passed away, and I was driving down, I lived in Atlanta at the time, and I was driving down to Mobile, and I had an idea for a mystery novel that would star my grandmother, and so I just started brainstorming it, and I was like, oh, I'm not a writer, but but that idea just kept bugging me so much, I just kept going with it. Well, that book is still under the bed. I did finish it. (laughs) I did NaNoWriMo with that one, but the bug had started, and so then um, I also have always loved time travel um, stories, and so then the next NaNoWriMo, uh, I was like, what can I do? And I was always fascinated by Ada Lovelace, and so I decided to write a time travel around um, where my heroine goes back and meets Ada Lovelace. And so then that started my writing stuff. Yeah. So everything that I saw, like every article about you that I saw, credited you as a romance writer, but it sounds like you're a bit of a jack of all trades. Is that no? Accurate? Actually, uh, aside from the first book that I wrote, which was a mystery novel, everything else since then has been romance. <laughs> so you would identify as romance novels. Yes. You just happen to have written yes. other stuff early yeah. on. Uh-huh. What, what drew, drew you in that direction? Oh, I think I'd always um, been drawn to, like whenever I would read a non-romance book that ended sadly, I would always rewrite the ending in my head to have a happy ending. And um, I, I, it's just a, such a, a positive, affirming genre and uh so i thought well let me try it you know i love reading them so i thought well let me try writing them so then that's what drew me to it but i love being able to explore positivity and um love and uh and having every all that sort of being affirming instead of doom and gloom yeah i think <laughs> we have enough of that in life. <laughs> yeah i think it's an interesting time because especially for books now because mm-hmm. like it feels like everything has a bit of spice in it these days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and do you feel like that's like, does that make sense to you that we're in that place or do you, are you surprised by it? Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm,
thought about whether or not I'm surprised by it. Um, I think because it's Because it, I feel like 10 years ago, it wasn't, right? Yeah, yeah. I think um, certain things, like, um, of course, Fifty Shades of Grey made it more mainstream and acceptable to be able to talk about it. And, um, and uh, I think that kind of probably helped open the door for that, so to speak. Um, and um, I think it's great at being able to be healthy about that kind of um, part of our lives. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about like some of your books that you would like. What would you like to talk about of your books? You could talk about early ones. You could talk about recent ones. Whichever one you want to. Um, so most of mine, I have a series, must love series. It's all time travel romances. Um, so they go down. I love history. I'm a huge history buff. Um, and so this was my chance to explore different parts of history. So one of them goes back to Regency England. Another one goes back to 13th century Wales. Uh, another. Another one or two sisters who go back to um, an early Jacobite um, revolution in, Sc in Scotland. And then I have another series with Entangled, uh, first book, and that one goes back to like 160 AD in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have a series of contemporary uh, sports romances they, where they, um, the heroes play Gaelic football. Um, actually, they play hurling. I had originally written it as a Gaelic football story, and then I upped it to hurling because it's but I used to play Gaelic football, so I kind of drew on all that experiences. And then the only other one I wrote was a, a steampunk uh, one that's actually set in Mobile. So I, I hear a lot of like UK influences. Is that a fair thing to say? <laughs> Probably. Where, yes. where do you think that comes from? I think that's what I was reading too. I mean, I love <laughs> that you know, I love that history. Um, uh, and um, yeah, uh, the the one set here is an exception to that. Yeah. What made you want to write one for here? As I love Mobile, and um, and I just wanted to explore that. I want I uh, explored if Lincoln hadn't gotten shot, how different would the South have been after the Civil War? So I reimagined Mobile um, with that in place. Um, that particular part of history changed. Yeah, and that's interesting. To, let's, let's just sort of go down that mind okay. <laughs> trap now <laughs> for a bit. So. So are you thinking like the idea is that there'd be a stronger leader after mm -hmm. Civil War, so mm -hmm. maybe it would have been implemented mm -hmm. more? Like, like walk me through it a bit. Uh, in my in my picturing of it, I pictured having um, that all of the. I mean, we still have a long way to go uh, uh, with um, black-white relations, but I I imagined it that it would have started sooner, like maybe even seventy years sooner than it did. So I kind of backed up the timeline for a lot of things to be earlier. Um, and um, and then had Mobile also, uh, the World War II in industry that World War II had, which where we were building warships, I had that earlier where we were, um, because of us building the Hunley for the Civil War, I had us, Lincoln having Mobile be a hub for building submersibles and, and submarines for the federal government. And so having that kind of industry earlier in Mobile's history. Yeah, that's very cool. and. You know, to, to imagine a world where civil rights happened just mm -hmm. after the Civil War. Yeah. Like, that would have been very cool. Yeah. <laughs> think of where we'd be now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and was it set in modern, but in this reimagined? No, no, it was set in 18... Oh, God, because it's been seven or eight years since I wrote it, so now I'm forgetting <laughs> what year, but it was late 1800s. And I also pictured there was a... She was a reporter, and I modeled her after... Um, uh, Nellie Bly, and um, uh, there was a Jack the Ripper murders going on in Mobile, so she was trying to uh, solve those murders. So that was the backdrop. So something that fascinates me as a writer is the like the research that we have to do to write mm -hmm. stuff. Like I'm a fantasy writer, so a lot of it is like I made this up, so like I don't need to research it. But then there's a ton of stuff that I do have to research, mm -hmm. especially like cultural things and mm -hmm. stuff like that. What kind of research? You said you do a lot of history stuff, so you probably do a ton of that, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. So I'll, before I even start writing, I'll do a bunch of research. Um, uh, even if I feel like I'm familiar with that era, I don't want to make assumptions. In fact, that's when you do get in trouble. Like I knew a lot about Jane Austen and Ada Lovelace, and so I was make I was going from memory, and then I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> that was wrong because I was going from memory. So even if if it's something you're familiar with, you still need to kind of go back and check your sources and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I do a ton of research beforehand, get immersed in that world, and then start shaping it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have to do a lot of like, like when you do the one for mobile, do you do a lot of research specifically in like city structure and things like that? I didn't and get so much into that. Um, uh, no, I didn't actually. <laughs> I knew a lot about. I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I was writing an alternate history on that, and so I was. I kind of let my imagination fly with having, uh, you know, because I had cruise ships like we do um, here, modern day era. I had cruise ships that were also submarines because that was such a part of the 
the steampunk world. Yeah. And, uh, so I do research on that kind of stuff, but not mobile structure. Yeah. So whenever you, how do you come up with your character? Talk a little bit about that. Oh. Um. So your first one was based on your grandmother, correct? Yeah, that was some for an unpublished one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it comes out of. Uh, for each one's different. Um, so sometimes they come, the character comes first, um, and then some I do the research and um, I just kind of journal. And so I'll uh, write, going, well, what if this is, you know, what if this was their background, or what if they were doing this, and what if, you know, and so sometimes just the process of handwriting out, like as if I'm that character, and writing out, like, as if I'm exploring my own psyches, but yeah. the characters. <laughs> That a lot of, of times elicits a lot of stuff in background material that helps them go, oh, well, then that would be this and this. But it's been different for every book. I mean, that's sure. Has it been for you that way, too? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to think about characters because I, I've i been doing a ton of promotion for this book over the past few months. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like interviews will say, like, can you describe your main character? Describe. And the truth is, if you have a fleshed out character, it is hard to describe them. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, like, like I described it this way in an interview once, which is like, you know, like there's characteristics that I started with, right? Mm -hmm. Like this person's smart and this mm -hmm. person gets angry easily or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. But then like once they get fleshed out, it's like, how do you describe your best friend to somebody? You yeah. know? Yeah. And then you can also start missing them too. Have you ever had a book slump afterwards when it's a public? Oh yeah. Oh, you're about to get a pub. So you're about to experience that. <laughs> so you get a book slump afterwards where you just kind of, it's almost, have you ever been in a play? Mm -hmm. So you know that feeling after the play ends yeah. and you miss that, um, that rush and that energy being around all those people in that um, particular world yeah, and being immersed in it and then all of a sudden it's gone, you'll have that experience after the book launches. Yeah, so right now <laughs> I'm writing, so, so it's a whole weird thing with this book. So, so this book is a short story collection. Mm -hmm. The following book, I'm going to be doing a series of light novels, so like the manga looking yeah. novels. Um, I'm going to first of all break this book up into two, that way there's like easier, cheaper versions to buy it. But then I'm going to do th four additional characters, like featuring them, and then my novel, which is set in this world, comes out the following summer. Okay. So like it's a very long, <laughs> like, yeah. extensive plan. But like right now, so I wrote this, like I wrote a bunch of women in this first book, mm -hmm. and like a lot of like interesting like fantasy stuff. And now I'm writing a book about like a changeling who's like in this like secret assassin society, which is like very fun and cool. Mm -hmm. But I really miss like the fun banter, you know, <laughs> of the, <laughs> the earlier characters. <laughs> Is that the kind of thing you're? Yes, you'll miss that. Um, and if you if you want, you can channel that into doing some extras that you send to your fans, you know, in your newsletter and that kind of thing. But yeah, you'd miss miss having that those characters and interacting with them and having that banter if they had it. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah because this, you know, I always had a lot of fun kind of like developing the world around them. Mm -hmm. You know, like who are who are their friends and family? Who's the people in their life? Who are they meeting to do this thing or whatever? And with this character, it's very, like, insular because, like, he's every character, basically, okay. you know, oh, because wow. he's a cha yeah. shapeshifter. Yeah. So, and, and then, like, there are obviously people around him, but, like, I'm focusing on this character. And it's so interesting and different, but also, like, I don't, like, I feel like it's fun, but in a different way, yeah, you no, know? that's good. That's good. <laughs> so are you writing anything now? Actually, I'm not. Um, when I um, started the bookstore, um, it's taken up so much of my time. Um, but I am moving in that direction. In fact, I just had a, a, a little seed start the other day where I started researching some books that I need to go ahead and start ordering um, to, to um, kind of immerse myself yeah. and see what kind of story might come out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with that because I've been writing this book, the one I was talking about, for the past four or five months mm -hmm. <laughs> because... Because it's, like it's a short book, but I've been very busy. Mm -hmm. Turns out when you book a book tour by yourself, it's not like you don't have a ton of free time. No, I would imagine that. <laughs> so, so like I've been trying to find time for writing, but like, you know, if your brain is like mentally stressed out and tired, like you can't just make yourself That's write, good. And then know? also my brain is such where I get hyper-focused on something and then everything else sort of, and right now my high, well, for the last four and a half years has been the bookstore. And so I'm kind of a, nervous about delving into that world again and getting lost in it and then having the bookstore sucker. So I'm trying to make it where I have my office at the house and so then it's sort of a separate thing yeah. where I, it's a clear delineation. Hopefully that'll help my brain. Um. Yeah. No, I get it. I'm a, I'm a teacher for my day job and 
I decided early on I wasn't going to grade at home because, you know, I feel like if you're a teacher, it's easy for that job to become your entire life, mm -hmm. which also I, I used to own a comic shop, so I fully understand as a shop owner, also that can be your whole life if it you is. let it. It is. And, and I unfortunately let it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's important to, like, figure out where those lines yeah. are so that, mm -hmm. so that you're not just fully, like, that job is your identity. Mm -hmm. um, so... so and I mean, like, so what did you do before, like, for your day job, before you worked with a shop owner? Uh, actually, I worked at a bookstore. So, um, uh, and before that, I was, well, actually, so when, when I started writing, that was when I was at a bookstore. Um, I said, no, wait, technically, actually, I was doing, I just moved to, yeah, I had just moved to Mobile. And that was, I started, I started writing that mystery novel, then I moved to Mobile. Um, and, um, and then I was working at a Bienville Books, which is in the, old location where we used to be, so then when he closed that store, I opened this one. Um, but before that, I was, um, my brother and I had a web design company, and then before that, I was a director of a small local history museum outside of Atlanta, so I've had lots of different jobs. And had you been writing, like, bits and pieces? No, I was, like, Just most of my store. life, um, most of my life, I'd always come up with different ideas, mostly in sci-fi, ironically, um, and I'd be like, oh, that'd be so cool, that would be a great book, but... I'm not a writer, um, and so I just let it, you know, fly away, and I would always keep doing that because I had in my head that you had to have be able to perfectly, from the get-go, if you were a writer, it meant that you had golden words coming out of your mouth yeah. right from the get-go, and I didn't, and so I thought, oh, well, then I'm not a writer. I, 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 actually, James Scott Bell's book was what convinced me to try it um, because um, in there he said that 90% of writing is craft, and I can learn. <laughs> yeah. I'm good at studying and learning, and so I just devoted myself to learning the craft. And um, and I felt like I had the creative, like the other five, ten percent is your creativity, and um, and I had that. I just yeah. didn't have the craft. And so that, I would say that to anybody who's an aspiring writer, it feels like they're not, they don't have the craft. You can learn it. <laughs> Honestly, the thing that is so like confusing and frustrating, and I think hard to start mm -hmm. in any creative field. Mm -hmm is you kind of have to think until you make it a bit. Mm -hmm. Like, if you've decided to be a musician or a writer or whatever, you have to, like, know that you're good. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and, like, even if you don't believe it, you yeah. have to, like, know it deep mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like, what's the point, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a weird thing where you just have to, like, decide one day. Like, mm -hmm. I am a good writer, and mm -hmm. I should do this. <laughs> yeah, though you always get plagued by that whole imposter syndrome thing, you know, which I think is healthy, though, too. Um, but, yeah, that's a – imposter syndrome is a, is a thing, for sure. Um, do you feel like it's been creeping up at all recently? Uh, no, because I haven't really been in the, the – immersed myself in that world. <laughs> so – so these days you're feeling pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like that distance helps, like from actually doing it? Yeah. Though I do. What I probably want to do is reread some of my work now that I've had distance from it for years now, uh, four and a half years. Um, so I need to uh, reread some of my stuff and just see how you know with that kind of distance, would it how it holds up. You know? And I will say what's interesting for me, and hopefully you've had similar experiences, and I'm not just like humble bragging right now, mm. but like I. Oftentimes when I'm writing it, I feel like it's not mm -hmm. where I want it to be or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then after I edit it, and then I go back and then I like leave it because I, mm -hmm. you know, I've been busy promoting it, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. Then I go back and read it, and I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it can surprise you like that. Or I came up like a, you know, how Facebook does those memories, you know. And one came up recently that had a, a uh, an image that I had made with a quote from the book and a background image, and I was like. Oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> I, wrote that. I didn't even have any memory of that line, and I and I was like, oh wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, the thing happening most recently for me is the audiobook just got finished, uh -huh. so the narrator has been sending me like samples to uh -huh. approve, uh -huh. and and like I teared up once listening to one of my own chapters, and I was uh -huh. like, how does this happen? <laughs> yeah, I thought that happened. It was also when the narrator was, and I had a really good narrator, Mary Jane Wells, and she um. I actually write under a pen name, actually. It's Angela Quarles, not Angela Trude, but um, Mary Jane Wells. That would explain why I could never find. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Mary Jane Wells is an excellent narrator. Um, she just got my books, and when she was, I, I had gotten so tired of my first book, um, the one that first published book. By the time I was actually listening to her, edit, you know, her and going through the edits, I actually got, I laughed again and like cried and that kind of thing. So it was, it was amazing to hear it in a different medium. Yeah, I feel like sometimes, 
Because I mean, obviously, you, you need an editor, right? That you can't mm -hmm. not have an editor mm -hmm. because you need someone to look at it that's not you. Like, yeah. you, you're too close to yeah. it. You can't judge it yourself. Yeah. But but also, like, I think after, after all that, like, you have to just give yourself some time and not mm -hmm. do anything with it mm -hmm. so that you can come back and appreciate it later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about networking with bookstores and how to get your book into bookstores, yeah. all those cool okay. things. Okay, sounds good. All right, we'll be right back. Okay, so again, in, in the real podcast, there'll be a break here. Okay. We're just going to keep going. Okay. Um, welcome back to Most Writers Are Fans. My name is Terry Bartley, uh, your host, and we are talking about um, books and bookstores with Angela Trigg, mm -hmm. Angela Quarles, mm -hmm. um, who is a bookstore owner and a romance author, because I feel like she has an interesting perspective in like this intersection. So what has been your experience on either side? Oh. Uh, I remember as an author how hard it was to get my book into bookstores um, because most of mine were um, self-published in the beginning um, and I would have, you know, people, bookstore owners closing the door or, you know, the metaphorical closing the door to me right off the bat. So I experienced that end of it. And then when I, um, but as a, I was also working in a bookstore so I kind of got it, but I wasn't owning one so I didn't quite get it yeah. <laughs> until I actually owned the bookstore. Um, and so it has been a different um, experience, and it is interesting seeing the whole, I wouldn't say I, actually that is inaccurate to say, seeing the whole picture, because I've never been a publisher, um, but having this kind of a um, perspective on it has been different. So what kind of, let's start with this, what kind of missteps have you seen authors make, like, from your end? Okay, so uh, one of the biggest missteps is mentioning Amazon um, when they're pitching you their book. Um, and I think it stems from that there is a perception out there that Amazon is the supplier of books to everyone, including bookstores, um, and that is not true. They are actually just a, a reseller like we are. They get their books just like we do from a publisher or a distributor. And so I think that, I was trying to think of where does that misperception come from, and I think it really, it is not from any kind of, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is there, but um, it's not an intentional mistake. I think it's just they really honestly are mistaken about how the book industry actually works and where we get our supplies of books. And so if you understand that part, that we get our books from publishers and distributors just like Amazon does, you wouldn't walk into, let's say, Barnes & Noble and tell them, oh, you can get your books from Books A Million. That's a competitor. Yeah. Amazon is a competitor. Um, and so that is where the number one problem that uh, uh, authors do is when they're pitching their book they mention that we can get it at Amazon it's like uh, no we can't <laughs> not unless we don't want to make any money um, because we need to be able to buy wholesale just like Amazon does we have to buy wholesale yeah just to provide a bit of insight to you which might also like clear it up for other authors mm -hmm. Is so, so if you publish through KDP which mm -hmm. is like the like you know in, in deep press that mm -hmm. Amazon runs mm -hmm. Um, you can distribute wide through them, mm -hmm. and then they will provide your book wholesale to other distributors. Exactly. So that is probably what they are doing. Mm -hmm. They have probably published it through KDP, mm -hmm. and they think that you're that you order it from like a wholesaler that they have. Yep. But yeah. they don't. Yeah. They just print it, and yep. then they give it to other people. Yep. Not give it. They sell yep. it to yep. other distributors. Yep. Um, or, or you could also go on Ingram Spark, um, and Ingram Spark is a way of publishing um, your book there. Um, and you would set it at 55% um, discount so that we then can buy it at a 40% discount because Ingram Spark, which is Ingram, takes 15% cut, which is fair. Yeah. Um, but that's also a misconception where people don't understand they'll do it at a short discount at like 40, thinking that we're getting the 40%, which is the industry standard. But no, that's actually makes it 20, you know, that's yeah. horrible math. But anyway, <laughs> it makes it a lot less uh, percent that we see on the Ingram side. So our distributor, the only big one left now uh, is Ingram, and so that's where we order our books from if we don't order directly from the publisher. Well, honestly, that's I, I think it's nice with Ingram because you have more control. Mm -hmm. Like like with Amazon, if you distribute wide, they will provide it to distributors, but you have no control over what the mm -hmm. discount is. Mm -hmm. Which, which I think, as a as an indie author, like you want to have like some say over like how much money you're going to yep. get, but then also like how much money indie bookstores are going to save. Yeah. Because yeah. I think that that's, yeah. I think that it just sort of shows respect to the indie bookstores yeah. if you set it low enough that they actually get a discount out yeah. of it. Yeah. So and I, I kind of look at print um, as uh, if I had actually been with the publisher, I would only be making fifty cents to a dollar on any print book anyway. So I don't, you know, that's what I just price mine enough to where if I 
when I give the proper discount, I'm only making about a dollar on a book when I sell it. Okay. That's that's what I've been shooting for also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, it sounds it sounds crazy because <laughs> you know, like you want to make more than a dollar per right. book, right? And right. you and you also want to like, um, you you don't want to like have to get a bunch of returns. Like mm -hmm. that's the big thing that I think a lot of people are worried about. Mm -hmm is like having bookstores return and maybe talk a little bit about that too because I think that's yeah. more useful for authors to know about. So um, it depends on if you're really, really trying to go wide with a lot of bookstores nationally, um, you want to have it set at returnable because a bookstore is not going to take your chance if they can't actually return it. It also affects if you're going to be doing um, book signings at bookstores. Like I won't take an author um, to do an event if I can't return their books. So if it's a case where they have it non-returnable, they have to supply their own books, and then we get a cut from when they sell it at the event. Um, so having a returnable really helps your chances in getting in more bookstores. But if you really know like that your book is is hyper local, and only the people in your area are going to be interested, your local bookstore should carry it anyway, and they won't care if it's non-returnable. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are some bookstores that make a blanket rule. You know, can't help. It. That. But in general, yeah, you want to have it returnable, it's, but it's not always. You just have to be kind of a case by case basis. I guess on that. Yeah, so I feel like a lot of this is just kind of like navigating the industry and learning mm -hmm. that side of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, like, have authors come in here like with books in hand, like mm -hmm. trying to sell them to you, like wholesale, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or even <laughs> <laughs> I've had them come in and um, I said, uh, I said, well, how much is this? How much would I be paying you? And they tell me the price, and I said, so then what's the What's what's the retail price? And they tell me the same price. I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> you have to make some money. Yeah, yeah, we're a business. We have to be able to have some room in there to make some money. Or why are we putting it on the shelves? We're not a nonprofit. We're not a library. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I know that sounds crass, but it's like that's reality. I think that's the other. When mistake. you can't make no money on right. a book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will make some. Ex like, there's there's one book that was that is local that hardly anyone else has written about that aspect of our history and um, their discount on um, Ingram is zero but I order it and I go ahead and just tack on a couple dollars on it um, but uh, you know you just it, <laughs> again it's all a case-by-case -case basis but if you're you know if you're a regular author producing a fiction book you need to be able to have it priced in the industry um, like there's, I know one bookstore that talked about how someone was came in to pitch their kids' chapter book, which you know, a kids' chapter book is a tiny little book that's about, you know, yeah. a couple millimeters thick, and it was priced at twenty four dollars for a paperback kids' chapter book, and it's way, way, way outside of yeah, yeah. <laughs> those normally go for four ninety nine, five ninety nine, you know. Um, so know your market, know what other books in your industry um, in your genre are selling at, and and act accordingly. But yeah, you can. Authors will come in and have done no research on how you pitch a book, and it's going to be different for each bookstore. So my advice is, go to the website of the bookstore you want to be in, look at what their submission process is, and follow it. And I think the part of it too is like, I think it's good to just meet bookstore owners mm -hmm. and not have expectations. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because like, whenever I set up this interview with you, I didn't. At no point did I say. Will you please talk my book in your bookstore? Mm -hmm. Like obviously, mm -hmm. I hope you do, mm -hmm. right? But like, mm -hmm. I didn't at any point say that, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that establishing like, I don't care if you stock my book. Ultimately, mm -hmm. I would just like to know who you are so that I can like work with you in the future. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that's a valuable way to approach it. Like, oh, yeah. do you think that that is that has that have you responded better to that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, oh yeah, and um, and then also just you know if you're local, being a customer of the store, if you've never ever stepped foot in here, and then all of a sudden you're here to, it's like. You obviously read, so where are you getting your books? You <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, having that sort of relationship um, building is great. Yeah, um, we have a very healthy relationship with our local writers guild, and it's been great. I mean, we do things together um, and have a great synergy. Um, uh, you know, mainly because I have the same. Wait, two of my other employees are also authors, so I have like. A, children's book young adult author and then another one is historical fiction author so we get writers <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk about it from your end as an author what kind of things have you done to get your book in bookstores I actually um, like have you like gone out and talked to bookstores I did and, when I you know uh, and had that whole thing of like making the same rookie mistakes um, and um, so I kind of 
because I'm non-confrontational. <laughs> okay, I would let it drop. I did have an opportunity to try to get it in a store from my hometown, which is that's why I asked you where in Sarasota. I mean, in Florida, because I grew up in Sarasota. I never lived in Sarasota for a long time. <laughs> um, and I uh, had an opportunity to be able to have an event at that bookstore there, and then I just let it drop for some reason. I don't know, because I got busy or something. I'm not sure what I did. But anyway, um, uh, I didn't actually pursue it too hard. Um, I did do the... Um, program that Barnes and Noble had where if you sold a certain amount of ebooks and they would let you sell in their store and so I went through that process and got approved for that um, and I know when I won the Rita which is the award the romance award um, I, I noticed that my book was being just independently bought by a lot of different stores to, to stock so that was awesome <laughs> So obviously we both do, because mm -hmm. you're a bookstore owner, I'm a person driving two bookstores across the country. Mm -hmm. we, we do see some value in having your book on a bookstore shelf. Mm -hmm. What do you, could you sort of talk about that? Because I feel like a lot of authors feel like, because I've seen this advice like mm -hmm. on online various, multiple times, which is like, don't worry about bookstores, just sell your stuff online. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like is the argument against that, like that mentality? Um. I would say because our readers are different here. So bookstore is a reason I don't see myself as in competition with Amazon, even though they are technically a competitor, um, is because um, we're about the experience. And so a, a, a reader coming into our store, nine times out of 10, doesn't have a particular book in mind. They want to explore and see and have a book jump out at them that they discovered here. You can't really do that online and so you might actually as a um, lesser known author might have a better chance of being discovered um, by a reader when you're actually in a retail store now that is if you have a stellar cover mm -hmm. a title that just grabs you and you want to go what is this you know um, and so um, if you have those going for you already then I would say for sure being in a bookstore helps you get that discoverability now it's on a smaller scale but with TikTok now, you know, you just need that one customer to come in and yeah. just find your book and then they're like gushing about it on TikTok, then, mm -mm. you know, boom. <laughs> yeah, then it blows up. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and that's kind of where I where I like to because like obviously I want to sell them a bookstore. Obviously I want to help independent bookstores because you know I think small business is important. I think the communities need small business, and I want to I want to be a part of that, right? But also like I think as a more like financial crass perspective is like I think it's good marketing, you know? Like I think that if your book is on a bookstore shelf, even if they don't buy it at that bookstore, they might buy an ebook or an audiobook or whatever because it feels more credible, I think, yeah. when they see it on a shelf. Yeah. Does yeah, that yeah. make sense? Yeah, and all the notes of marketing and wisdom that you have to see it seven times before you, yeah. you know, um, buy it. Um, so that's, you can count that as one of your seven times. Well, and if somebody comes into a shop regularly, <laughs> they might get all seven in the bookstore. Yeah, yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like that's that's sort of how I approach it. Is, is I think that it's an important marketing tool. I also think, like, obviously, I think it's good to build these relationships that, like, like, I would love to do events here after I have books to sign, right? Like, it'd be cool to actually know that know people by name and face and not just... Because I had to do, like, blind emails this time. That is terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. Yeah. And, and it's rough, especially in these communities that I'm not a part of, to mm -hmm. be like, hey, can I come in and do a thing? Mm -hmm. But I think that doing, like, this go-around where it's kind of like, I'm not actually really promoting anything, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of, like, showing up and meeting people, it, it's established. Okay. <laughs> Google Assistant came up for some reason. I'm so sorry. People are watching. <laughs> and then it was capturing everything we said as a request for Google Assistant. Oh. <laughs> so I don't know what I thought. Oh my gosh. Did I, did I no. say the word Google? No, one of us might have. Okay. But it's fine. <laughs> I caught it quickly. Okay. Um, so, uh, what are you, so any, any sort of tips or, or things or, or for bookstore owners too? Mm -hmm. I think that that's maybe useful. Like, what would you tell like bookstore owners? about stocking like indie books? I would say, um, I think they're shooting themselves in the foot by being hardline about not stocking any. Like there'll be some bookstores that say none whatsoever and they are just a hardline about it. And I get it. I mean, it's easier just to yeah. not deal with something because we have enough on our, I mean, that's one thing I would say to authors, understand that we owners are sometimes are the only one running the shop. So we're not only checking them out, but we're also ordering, buying, blah, blah, blah. Have a lot of hats. Um, I have staff who runs the, you know, run the floor itself, 
um, but still, I've got a lot of hats to yeah. wear. Um, so we're busy, um, and so I know it's easier as an owner just to, you know, draw a hard line, but I would say you're also losing out on, on building relationships, and, you know, I know some will say, well, you know, they, they're not coming into my store, so why should I support them? And I was like, you know, and I know I said that earlier, it's like, you, you would like to see that, yeah. but I don't, I don't let that be a um, determining factor. I, I've never seen anything before, that's fine, okay, but maybe they might now, you know? Someone's got to give there. <laughs> I think there's something kind of cool about being on the ground floor of a new author. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, if somebody does blow up, like, yeah. wouldn't you love to say I had their book yeah, on my shelf true. early on? Yeah, yeah, true. Mm -hmm. So I, this is kind of just some inside baseball for a minute. So mm -hmm. I emailed a store. And, like, at this point, I wasn't even, again, I wasn't trying to get a stock. I was just saying, like, hey, mm -hmm. I want to do the podcast there, whatever. And the bookstore got back to me and said, um, they were busy, which like what it, like I understand scheduling, mm -hmm. but then they said that they couldn't stock the book because it was print on demand. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Have you? Yeah, I mean that, that's that's what some won't do if, cause if they're print on demand because most of the times print on demand is not returnable. So that's where you're running into that there because uh, print on demand typically. But it will say if it is returnable, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some are. Um, mine, so, mine is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they might just be like. Mm. Yeah, and I, uh, I can't really tell. Everybody has their way of running their business. So, I, and that's what makes bookstores, indie bookstores, unique. Is that each one is going to be different. We're not yeah. all cookie cutter. So it's actually it's a double edged sword there. You know. <laughs> yeah, because I was I was always wondering like, what, how much do you see and how much you know what I mean? Because uh -huh. I never have any idea. Yeah, like, because yeah. because everything's from my end. What yeah. I like, what the publisher so author sees. We um. We see a lot of books, so um, there are between 800 to 1,000 books a day published, and we are getting pushed constantly from publishers and the reps um, on books that are traditionally published. So, I mean, I am my email inbox is just constantly, you know, just me sitting here. It's probably now gotten you know filled up. Yeah. I say filled up as if I don't have 20,000 unread <laughs> emails on there, but. Anyway, there's going to be some unread. Well, be twenty thousand additional yes. unread emails. <laughs> so understand that we get pitched just just from publishers a lot. I mean, we are constantly looking at catalogs, and then on top of that, you have all the indie publishers. I mean, indie um, authors. Um, and so just make sure that when you do pitch, that a like you're doing what I said, or just go to the website, see how they want to have it pitched. Don't just show up at an event that, where they're harried and busy with someone else, and then talking to them about your book. Um, do research and um, find out how they want it submitted and then pitch it as like a one sheet and talk about where they can get it and hopefully you say Ingram and that it's um, at this you know uh, with this ISBN blah 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 don't mention Amazon at all but then say why you think that book would sell in their store so in other words if it's Southern Gothic and you're pitching to, to stores in the south that makes you know, sense. Make sure to mention that, or that it takes place in their city. <laughs> Make sure to mention that, because you know, if it's a indie author from Nevada pitching me their thriller set in California, nothing against that book. It's like, but why would my reader here want yeah. it? Um, is it speaking about something that's relevant right now? Um, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, see, you have to be a publicist too. You've got to take off your author hat and then put on your publicist hat and figure out why, you know, why would that book sell in that store? Yeah, and I, I think it comes down to knowing your story and then mm -hmm. knowing your audience, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I think that most books could have universal appeal, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to articulate that, mm -hmm. you know? Because, I mean, even if something gets set in a very specific place, it has, mm -hmm. like, you can still, like, say these experiences are universal. Or mm -hmm. This is a thing that I, like, mm -hmm. tie it to your personal story. That way yeah. it's more compelling. But you know? I will say, don't, don't, because <laughs> I've seen this, don't pitch your book saying, uh, my book is better than John Grisham. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> and and you would be a fool not to carry my book. I mean, that's not the way to pitch a book. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so uh, agents always want, like, comp titles, right? Mm -hmm. Do you guys, is that useful for you guys? Yes. Um, so that would be another way of pitching it, saying this would be, you know, such and such meets such and such, or here's my comps. Just like you pitch to an agent, you're pitching to a bookstore now. So it's the same thing. So you've got to have your query, your your um, blurb, you know, down pat with your tagline, you know, what what's going to grab them. If I see a tagline at the top and it sounds intriguing, I'm going to keep reading. But if it's just a wall of paragraphs with nothing standing out, and I'm like... I'm sorry, but I'm just going to delete yeah. and move on. 
Now that's a really solid tip because I think that a lot of authors probably have their query letters, mm -hmm. right? And I think that just sort of like using because and there's tons of resources out there mm -hmm. for like how to write a query letter, what mm -hmm. should you do, what should you include, all the all these what makes a good query letter. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's not a ton of resources for like what makes a good letter to a bookstore, mm -hmm. you know? Like that's a thing that I feel you kinda have to like figure out for yep. yourself. Which I mean maybe that's a whole market. Any other nonfiction <laughs> writers out there that might want to do that. Mm -hmm. That's maybe something to think about. But there's not a ton of resources for that. And and, and I think that you know, you could use all the things of how to write a query letter and just change it for a bookstore, yep. and that would be totally appropriate. Yep. That, that just, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then just include at the bottom, uh, after your comps, you just include available, um, you know, at Ingram, um, at a such and such discount, Here, and put the ISBN without dashes right there too. Publishers make that same mistake. They won't put the ISBN in there, and I'm like, okay, now I've got to <laughs> copy paste this title go into you know blah 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 and try to find it and all that stuff put the ISBN in the email yeah you don't want the bookstore to have to go to Amazon to find yes. the ISBN yeah or you're, you're also creating more robot bumps you're creating friction try to make it as frictionless as possible for the person who's going to be buying it hopefully buying it alright so any final tips for any, any like rapid fire last things you think keep in um, mind before just, uh, I'll, I'll just reiterate, remember we're a business, so we need to make a profit. Uh, and I know that sounds, you know, crass, but that's true. Uh, that we don't get our books from Amazon, don't mention Amazon. Um, and um, do your research for each bookstore um, and support indies. We're great. <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much, Angel. This has been really informative. I really have appreciated chatting yeah, with you. Yeah, I think no, that this is, great. I think yeah. this is useful for not just me, but like any author out there that wants to know more about this. Um, so if people want to find more about you, your books, your shop, mm -hmm. I need, where should they go to do that? So if they want to know more about the shop, you got to go to thehauntedbookshopmobile.com. Um, and we, are, we sh ship all over the um, U.S. Um, and then uh, for Author World, um, it would be angelaquarles.com. That's A-N-G-E-L-A-Q-U-A-R-L-E-S.com. Very clever. I like the fun. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming here. Yeah, thank you. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye. No, I'll do a real close later. Well, thanks so much. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and bye, bye, TikTok. Thank oh. you. <laughs>